Europeans Communication Congress. And now I will start translating the Herald. Um, it is a great pleasure to present André uh, Matthias Koch, who is going to talk about fourth uh, on microcontrollers. Please have a round of applause. Hello. Compiler optimizations for microcontrollers. Also, so who knows? Who of you knows fourth? That's about half of the people. So I should rather or better explain what fourth is. So fourth is a language that is stack based, and it uses reverse Polish notation. So first you. Um, push the uh, operands on the stack and then you specify the operator. There's also, so there's one stack for the uh, values and the operators and there's also a second stack for the return addresses of the functions. The compiler itself is very simple. It is based on the um, so that you tokenize the input and if you find a word and if it is a known word then it compiles the word and and if it is recognized as a number then it is pushed onto the stack as a number otherwise it's called as a function or oh. And the nice thing about this language is that it is very small and it can easily be installed on a microcontroller. And because of this, it is relatively easy to test um, your software or your programs with this very small compiler instead of um, directly um, programming everything. And um, so this makes it a lot easier to find mistakes in your programs. Uh, I did not invent this language myself. It already ex exists for several years, it's, uh, several decades. And I, but I've written one um, compiler, which is not so, so uncommon because writing fourth compilers is not difficult. Um, is, it's rather unusual to present yourself. Um, so I'm, I'm a physicist. I have, um, I'm doing my PhD currently in um, laser spectroscopy in Algia, and so the name, so the name might be unusual, but, um, and. You're controlling the MSP 430, so the, it supports every MSP 430 launch pads. I'll talk later about the FPGA. The classical architectures, the ones that are usually implemented, you had a virtual machine that has a list of pointers. You take the pointer and you get another list of pointers, or instead you use uh, symbol parameters. This is very easy if you want to look for co errors in compilers because it makes it easy. And you can you do some unusual stuff during the construction of the compiler. Very old systems had the possibility to to uh, indirect the pointers across another table so that you could change them later on. So if you have a definition very deep in the system, you could change later on. It, it is also very easy to decompile it in the original or in the old fashioned way to implement it. You just take the object clone, you disassemble it, change the, the source code and then compile it again. The optimizations I'm going to present you destroy this aspect, of course, since here you use uh, machine code and you can't easily, you don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the output and the input anymore. 
problem to camp from that time, but it's a nice little guy. Well, I've already uh, always had this problem that it was a little slow, and of course my optimizations make this better. <laughs> from uh, compiler construction theory, this is all pretty old news. This has all been done ages before. But this is kind of hard to implement in small. And so there are different optimizations like um, tail call, uh, constant folding, inlining, um, um, and some others. And depending on which, so it's not available for all architectures, um, but I've listed the available architectures. And so now we talk about tail call. So in the, you can make a tail call if you have a function call at the end of another function, and then you can just skip the return, um, the return on the stack, and just compress uh, and shorten the path from jump returning from the function. And there's also constant folding, which does compile time calculations on numbers, so that in the end, in the final executable, there will be a, just a number and no calculation. So here we have an example where you just put 42 on the stack and then also put n and minus minus and some other things. And in the end, you can already ex uh, execute this code at compile time. And so in this case, it's pretty obvious that you can use it and and also with the help of other optimizations, it might be possible to create a situation where a constant folding is suddenly possible. And I would like to illustrate how a classical implementation of interpreters usually work. So if usually you start with a tokenizer, which tries to find uh, the tokens in the dictionary to see if they are already defined. And if they if there is a recognized token, so you have to decide if the code should be compiled or if it should not be compiled. And and if it should be compiled, then it will be compiled. And 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 sorry, I lost track. You need this for control structures because you can have jumps inside them. So if you don't find it, if it has to be compiled, then you put it on the stack. If you can already compile it, then put it, put the number on the stack. If it is not a valid number, then it is an error. If, in order to do that, there are, you don't have to do a lot of changes. It's just important that you don't compile the constants right away, but rather collect them. And if you have an operation that will produce constant output from the constant input, then you can immediately apply it. So at the very beginning, you now have to uh, have, have to take note of the uh, state of the current stack at the beginning to know how many variables you have to uh, available. And if, if you don't find another constant, then you don't have to do constant folding. You can just throw it away. In the compile mode, you check if the operator would produce constant output. And if uh, it has enough input values of a uh, constant class, obviously unary operators only take one constant, and uh, binary operators take two, and so on. So you, if you don't have enough yet, you just leave them there, and you just look later when you know enough. At every point, you know how many are necessary. If the definition is not usable at this point, then you have to compile the constants you already have and just do it the classical way. But you can also change the classical call uh, command. You can add uh, immediate checks. That means 
the function can have uh, special cases. Uh, numbers always stay on the stack, so they can uh, be uh, taken for the uh, constant folding later. It's important to know that when you add a, c a number, then it already puts a marker on the stack. If it's not, uh, if you can't interpret it as a number, then it's an error, obviously. This is, uh, in general, possible to achieve this on every architecture, independent of the way it works. I have seen from my colleague Matthias Tröte, he also implemented this on AVR. And the next thing, inlining, of course this also does the compiler. And so if you have the defini so we have the definition that you would just insert the call command, the body of the call command inside the calling code. And so you just insert the code at in place, basically. Then there's upcoding. I don't know how it's usually called. And opcode is is like a constant because an opcode is assembler, co assembler code basically and you could also put these opcodes onto the stack and then you can also use uh, various tricks with this uh, with the MSP 300 something this always works nicely but um, and there's also the register, register allocator um, um, usually, usually when you do calculations and forth, they end up on the stack. But it's more efficient to use registers, which are just faster than the stack. And because it's usually the stack is on, in memory, and you always have to retrieve the values from memory. And if you can create a shortcut, then it's a lot faster, and you can also just have shorter commands. Important is, it's important that it's all transparent for the programmer, because if you want to understand the logical structure, um, the compiler needs to know that, uh, needs to fall back to the original meaning of the code without the registers because programmers like to use all kinds of tricks. So the essential for the register allocator is to know which element is at which place. So during the compilation, the stack model has to be taken into consideration, and it has to be known which stack element is at in which register, uh, if at all. And yeah, so, and if there are some intermediate results, do we still have registers? And if we have more registers available, then we can use them. And if we don't, then we have to write the immediate intermediate values onto the stack. And it's you can implement it pretty uh, small or efficient, space efficient, and. Normally, with register allocators, you have algorithms that try to um, make it m most efficiently. I use a simple solution, so I just used. Um, so whenever there's a branching in the code, I would just not use the um, registers because it's too complicated. So I just stop there, and I just. Um, I'd like to use, uh, uh, show some examples. First, I need to know that um, so my work is based on many other nice things which I also will present. So for, uh, for example, these two guys have uh, created all this stuff which this talk is based on. So first of all, we have the constant folding which is um, so here's an example. 
So this is on the LEDCOM implementation with the LED light. Uh, LED you can use as a cathode and as an as a diode and as a cathode. I'm not sure how to translate this. And okay, sorry, this this was too fast. You were saying that you could implement different programs for your coffee machines and make the the LED signal error codes. So he defines a method called Shine and uses anode and cathode as um, outputs. If you disassemble it, this is what happens. A anode and cathode were constants that were folded into the hex uh, into the constant 11. Now we use a, a jump instead of a call. This is the tail call optimization, which you see with the I.O. part. You can also see the inlining at the point where the, the end at the anode was immediately inserted. And you have another tail call at the very end. And for the constant folding at the very beginning, there was a very simple example. During the compilation, the compiler already replaced it, the, the, the constant instead of using the opcodes. The plus is in the processor. So you can combine it with the, the opcode for the return. You can say a lot about that kind of processor. It's easy. It's about 200 lines very long. It's interesting to take a look at it if you want to, if you're interested in that kind of stuff. The MSP430 is a processor that has a lot of different ways of addressing uh, memory. With the tail call, there's a, a bit of trickiness with um, how you address this, so I didn't add tail calls here. So there's some examples here. You define constants, and at the very end, you again target the LEDs for output. This is an initialization for the launch pad. This is what it looks like when you compile it. Okay, you have constant folding again, and the commands are uh, put in via inlining directly. And you can take the parameters into the opcode coding, and the output, what you get, is already what you would write as an assembler code. The last instruction is uh, the return. The Micris Stellaris is a direct port of Micris, and the, the Stellaris launchpad was the first target. It's almost identical to the MSP430, at least in respect to optimizations. But it has a uh, register allocator that I want to show you now. Here's a more complicated example. This is the grade code. This is uh, if you if you count up, then only one bit changes. You can see that there is no movement on the stack anymore. The observed stack element is already included. The immediate value. Uh, intermediate values that were calculated are put uh, up on the stack again, and the shift command has a different register as a target here. And put it in on the top of the stack. So, uh, wait, um, so you don't need a stack for this. This is the thing that you try to use the registers as much as possible. This is a more sophisticated example. So here you have um, variables that should be, I think, in 
incremented. As uh, you have this address which is loaded, and then you load another address, and then you write it back. So you don't have any stack movements. So who is curious now and who wants to start? All MSP forty. Uh, 4030 launch pads and many ARM Cortexes are now supported. And who uses different systems also can use FORF. There is FORF for the PS PC and for R AVR and for PIC and for Z80. Many different FORF dialects and implementations. And the reason is that FORF is very simple and many people just write their own compiler because it's because it's fun. And even though m some people will behead me for this, um, you should just do it because you will get a deeper understanding about the language. And so both sides have good arguments and I think it it makes sense to just write your own FAF compiler. Be okay, some more example because I have more si time. So this tries to get some random numbers based on the digital uh, analog converter. And it reads f um, data from the analog um, reader and, and it adds up w with uh, yeah. the intermediate result. And um, so this is how it is compiled. Um, you see the loop. You push a zero on the stack. So let's have a look again. So there was already a zero in the beginning. And then you do a shift, which was inserted. And then you have the constant 10. Unfortunately, there's only one push command. So you have to use a different combination of stack pointer and something else. And consecutively, um, and, mm. and then you incre increment the loop counter and and once the loop uh, terminates, you can you jump back. And now we have seen all in one, like in a real example. This is a bigger example. The bit expansional function is like an exponential function, but uh, on bits. And you can see different things what happens when you have control structures in between. So in the beginning you have this, you check if the number has a certain uh, size and, and you check a certain register and if, if and once you have control structures and it is not clear which you need, then of course the number has to be saved if the condition is true. And you do some pushing and pushing and loading and unloading. Uh, in, so in the else branch, there's more work to do. Um, so you have the comparison is. Uh, is 16 greater or less than uh, uh, greater than 16 or equal? And if that is the case, then shift and wow. So here's some more work to do. You can already see that um, register one and register three. So you don't push the values on the stack, but you put them in registers. So this is not easy to understand. Um, um, 
So what you can also see here is that in ARM um, Cortex you can you can't insert a constant into the end before uh, end command, but but you can use shift use shift with command constant constants. And in the end, you have to tidy up. So far, this has been no problem because the last element was always returned. But now you have all these shifts and movings. And now we need. And that is why the highest element of the stack is not the element which is also in the register. And. Now the stack is in a state which is not in a state according to the canonical stack model. So you have to um, bring the stack back into a canonical state. But you can already see that you can you already can do all these operations without the stack. And however, this compiler does not look ahead and is always is therefore limited in its capabilities and it doesn't really take into account the control structures and branching so i've shown you all examples and i wish you a happy new year and i would ha happy to hear you hear from you via email my email address is on the slides